Well, good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Parkinsonian Symptoms, Capturing a Comprehensive Picture with Fit for Purpose Assessments. My name is Ryan Muse and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers and is approximately 60 minutes long. The webinars are designed to be interactive and they really work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit your questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance along the way, you can contact me at any time by sending a message using the same chat panel. At this time, know that all participants are in listen-only mode, and please note that the event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank CogState and Clario, who developed the content for this presentation. CogState is a leading neuroscience technology company, company optimizing brain health assessments to advance the development of new medicines. Clario is a leading healthcare research and technology company that generates rich clinical evidence for their pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device partners. Combined, their strategic partnerships bring together ECOA and Precision Motion Opal V2C sensor technology with leading cognitive assessment solutions to offer a streamlined single vendor experience for optimized sing signal detection in neuroscience trials. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Dr. Chris Edgar provides expert guidance to CogState's pharmaceutical customers through trial conduct. Prior to joining CogState as Senior VP Clinical Science in 2018, Dr. Edgar oversaw clinical endpoint strategy at Roche. He has held key positions, including Principal Scientist at Roche, Senior cl Clinical Lead at Bracket UBC, and Scientific Director at Cognitive Drug Research Limited. He holds a PhD in psychopharmacology and has 20 years of experience. Dr. Lyle Kingery is a clinical neuropsychologist with over 20 years experience in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease clinical trials. His expertise includes neuropsychological test training and central monitoring of radar and scale data in global trials. He has directed radar training and central monitoring programs for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other CNS indications trained raiders globally, and produced training videos for neuropsychological tests. And Dr. Kristen Sawalski uh, leads the scientific consulting services team for Precision Motion at Clario. With expertise in applied neuromechanics, kinesiology, and exercise science, she consults with clinicians, researchers, and product technologists, providing scientific evidence and advice to sponsors and CROs. Dr. Sawalski holds a bachelor's in kinesiology and exercise science, a doctor of chiropractic, and a PhD in applied neuromechanics. She is dedicated to improving patients' lives by building evidence for precision motion monitoring measurements of performance outcomes to capture clinically meaningful digital mobility outcomes. But now, without further ado, let's go ahead and hand things over to our first speaker for today. Dr. Chris Edgar, you may begin when you're ready. Thanks so much, Ryan. So welcome everyone to this webinar on comprehensive and fit for purpose assessment for clinical trials in Parkinsonian syndromes. Along with my colleagues, Lyle and Kristen, we'll seek to provide here uh, an overview of Parkinsonian syndromes and clinical trials in this space, as well as discuss practical considerations for the implementation of clinical outcome assessments, COAs, and digital health technologies, DHTs, in these trials. Parkinsonian syndromes then describe a cluster of diseases and disorders, including idiopathic Parkinson's disease, as well as a range of rarer disorders. Bradykinesia is the characteristic clinical sign leading to a diagnosis of Parkinsonism and is evident as a disorder of motor function with slowed small ampl amplitude movements that may affect limb control, speech, swallowing, gait, uh, facial expression and posture. In addition, extrapyramidal rigidity, rest tremor, postural instability are important clinical features, um, also motor features. But Parkinsonism shouldn't be viewed in purely motor terms and non-motor features that may be caused by dysfunction or degeneration in common or different systems may um, cover psychiatric, cognitive, 
autonomic cerebellar or pyramidal dysfunction. Common pathologic causes may also be observed with, um, for example, atypical Parkinsonian syndrome showing um, abnormal accumulation of different proteins such as alpha-synuclein, tau, amyloid, and TDP43. In clinical research and drug development then, this may lead to research efforts that include things like basket trials, the exploration of drug targets across multiple indications, and also common meaningful health outcomes in assessment tools across multiple trials and indications in this space. An example of this is the Biogen Gosaranumab program. This was an antibody against extracellular N-terminal fragments of tau. And this comprised a series of trials um, which included a, a phase 1b and a phase 2 trial in progressive supranuclear palsy, a phase 2 trial in early Alzheimer's disease, and also one of these basket trials, a phase 1b trial in four different primary tauopathies, corticobasal degeneration, uh, frontotemporal lobe degeneration, traumatic encephalopathy, and non-fluent primary progressive aphasia. Um, this basket trial employed the same clinical outcome assessments for all of the tauopathies, so the Schwab in England daily activities um, of living scale, functional activities questionnaire, Montreal cognitive assessment, and neuropsychiatric inventory. And, and whilst we know there are several important and established disease-specific rating scales, things like the, the PSPRS, the use of these generic clinical outcome assessments is also common. And as we've just illustrated in, in these trials of rare tauopathies, motor, functional, cognitive, and behavioral impacts of the diseases are all being evaluated. I'll pivot now into a brief comment on the challenge of demonstrating disease modification. Um, substantial effort we know is being expended to try and develop disease modifying agents and in Parkinson's disease around 40% of drugs in development are intended to be DMTs. However, there are relatively few phase three trials of DMTs and at the time of this review there were only three trials and we know that the, the conduct, the design of these trials face, faces significant challenge. Um, for a disease modifying claim then, both a delay in clinical measures of disease progression and an effect on the underlying pathophysiology must be shown. And this must correlate with a meaningful and persistent change in the clinical uh, functional picture for patients. And trial endpoints then should be able to reliably measure disease progression over the duration of the trial, and not only improvement from baseline due to a symptomatic effect, um, but also the need for longitudinal data um, is, is really critical to demonstrate that measures are sensitive to disease progression. Um, in practice, disease progression and disease modification can be difficult to demonstrate in Parkinson's disease due to a combination of the success of symptomatic therapies in treating motor symptoms and also the relatively slow progression of non-motor symptoms. So we can sometimes have this, this very small window in early untreated disease where um, instruments like the MDS UPDRS, um, the, the global um, motor functional assessment um, for Parkinson's disease is worsening. And this is occurring prior to initiation of symptomatic therapy and optimal control of motor symptoms. But once um, symptomatic ther therapy has been optimized, um, we, we're not really seeing disease progression in the same way until much later on in the disease course. Um, at the same time, over this period, um, we, we may see only very slow progression in non-motor symptoms and patient reported outcomes, but aren't, aren't terribly well addressed by current symptomatic therapies. Um, in these examples, then, we're looking at data from the roche prathena pasadena trial, um, which was um, studying potential disease modifying effects in an early stage population, as we've just described. So here, stage one or two on the Honan yar scale that spect which is consistent with Parkinson's disease, but no previous treatment for symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And the mds -UPDRS, as we can see in the left-hand panel, was the primary endpoint. So while some progression was clearly evident in the mds -UPDRS in this early population over the course of the trial, there was no meaningful effect of treatment observed on global clinical or indeed imaging measures of Parkinson's disease progression. However, in the right-hand panel, we can see um, some of the digital tools that were used, and these digital assessments more frequently measured um, active and passive assessments 
from the, the Roche Digital Health Technology approach did show some signs of, of encouraging effects of, of the drug. Um, there's clearly still work to do here, though, to demonstrate the meaningfulness of these effects. And you know, we know that FDA have previously commented about these kinds of approaches, that they, they have a preference quote for content that is more representative of daily life functioning, um, e.g. consistent with MDSUPDRS part two for other similar instruments. So it's important then for drug developers to consider um, a, a number of different clinical outcome assessments targeting different mini meaningful aspects of health, as well as digital health technologies. When we're in this space of, of clinical trials in Parkinsonian syndromes, um, and, and it's also then important to ensure such assessment tools are fit for purpose. Um, we know that substantial effort has gone into developing regulatory guidance in re recent times, both for clinical outcome assessments and digital health technologies in order to help drug developers ensure the tools they're selecting um, and developing are fit for purpose. Um, for, for COAs, COAs, that recent guidance covers things like the collection of patient experience data, the identification of what's most important to patients as it relates to burden of disease and burden of treatment, and then also approaches to um, the selection, modification, development, and validation of clinical outcome assessments. Um, and importantly, methods, standards, and technologies for collecting and analyzing that data for regulatory decision making. And in the next sections, we'll get on to um, some important considerations and, and some of the detail around the importance of that methodology, the standardization, and the use of technology um, for the collection of some of these kinds of data. And as noted, there is separate DHT guidance, um, but many of the same considerations apply. And this guidance stresses the need to select DHTs that are suitable for the context of use, um, to conduct verification and validation of those, to standardize their use for the collection of data for trial endpoints, um, and also to manage risk appropriately. So making sure that uh, physical risks, so risk of injury, and also privacy risks are, are well managed. Um, and then we'll move now into our poll question, and I'll hand back to Ryan briefly. Yes, thank you very much. So appearing on everyone's screen right now should be a polling question. It, uh, you can select on any of the answers you see in front of you to participate and then click submit. The question that we're asking is, what is the optimal endpoint outcome measure for disease-modifying therapies in Parkinson's disease? Your answer options are time to progression of motor symptoms, for example, MDS, UP, DS, DRS, part three, uh, continuous digital monitoring of motor function, cognition assessed via performance outcome, perf O assessments, patient reported outcome, PRO assessments, or other. We'll give everyone some time to consider an answer as it best applies to yourself to the question again of what is the optimal endpoint outcome measure for disease modifying therapies in Parkinson's disease? Looks like most of you have submitted your answer, so thank you very much for participating. Let's go ahead and take a look at where the results have come out. It looks like we have 50% of you selecting the time to progression, 20% uh, for continuous digital monitoring, 15% for patient reported outcome, 10% cognition assessment, and then 5% of rest of you for other. So thank you so much for participating. Um, and Dr. Aguirre, it's back to you. Thanks again, Ron. So in summary then, um, in Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonian syndromes, we know that they present with a range of overlapping clinical features. Um, this means that clinical trials in both clinically and pathologically grouped diseases and disorders need to evaluate this underlying set of common health-related concepts. Um, global and motor function assessments such as the mds cpdrs remain important outcome measures but there's also this need to address measurement concepts that are of relevance to patients and also may be more likely to demonstrate disease modification. Um, and this requires drug developers to go beyond some of these established tools. And the concept then of fit for purpose, um, we, we see covers a range of important characteristics of COAs and DHTs and their standardized application in clinical trials. And at this point, I'll hand to Lyle. Um, and, and of course, um, Kristen will outline in more detail um, some of the important considerations in this kind of standardized application. Over to you, Lyle. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks everyone for taking the time to attend.
my section of the presentation will be on, on key issues to consider when implementing comprehensive assessments in Parkinson's and related disorders in order to collect uh, meaningful data. I'll talk about uh, assessment collection and management, rater training, and central monitoring in the context of multi-site clinical trials. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of assessment selection, it, it, it's really determined by the constructs or the domains of interest and the scientific questions being asked in the clinical trial. And for many indications and constructs, these decisions are relatively straightforward. Uh, reliable, valid, and effective measures are available for many commonly examined domains and constructs. Um, but of course, it's uh, less true. Um, so uh, it's important to appreciate uh, that each assessment has a unique developmental history and scientific foundation. Many scales have uh, been widely used and are readily available in multiple languages, uh, but many are not, of course, and this information needs to be evaluated and understood as early as possible. Uh, finally, uh, decision to use a certain assessment can be impacted by the operational feasibility uh, of implementing the scale. Some scales are more difficult to implement than others from a rate of training and monitoring perspective. Now, assessment management refers to those activities that enable the use of the uh, scale or assessment in a, in a trial, particularly copyright or license requirements, which vary widely across scales, and translation availability, which is also uh, varies widely across scales. You want to evaluate these considerations very carefully as early as, as, early as possible in the process. Um, uh, importantly, too, most scales were not developed uh, for use in clinical trials. And the forms, the manuals, et cetera, uh, very often need some sort of adaptation and modification in order to be effectively used in clinical trials. A classic example of this is the mini mental state examination. Although widely used, the forms and the translations provided by the publisher, psychological assessment resources always require significant form design to, to implement accurately in global studies. Uh, finally, regarding assessment management, uh, a key decision that is often asked of us and, and you'll face is using paper or electronic data capture solution. And there are pros and cons to both approaches. Most scales are readily adaptable to a digital format. Uh, but there's always um, exceptions, and oftentimes there's still paper involved, uh, certainly with certain cognitive tests. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, uh, for each domain or construct uh, to be measured, uh, there can be multiple assessment methods. And the columns list different methods. I'm sure our audience is quite familiar with them. Um, but uh, the important point is that you want to think through this and decide for each of the domains, each of the constructs you're measuring, what's the most appropriate method uh, and how can it be uh, best, um, best gathered. Uh, there are, of course, motor examinations like part three of the mds cpdrs and similar motor examinations for other indications. Um, uh, clinician reported outcomes and in interviews, of course, can assess multiple domains of interest and uh, standardized cognitive tests, uh, obviously can measure cognitive function and other important motor functions uh, in Parkinson's and other indications like the 10 meter walk test or the time up and go test. And then of course, PROs are widely used in Parkinson's studies as they should be and um, provide really critically important information from the patient's perspective. And then some studies include diaries, certainly of dyskinesia, but uh, this approach can also be applied to other, uh, other domains and constructs. Next slide, please. Uh, just to acknowledge uh, their thanks in many regards to the hard work of the MDS, the Movement Disorder Society, and the Parkinson's community in terms of scale development. There are um, uh, well-established and uh, well-researched measures available for motor assessment, sort of traditional motor assessments like the MDS EPDRS, the Unified Dyskinesia Rating Scale, um, PSP Rating Scale, et cetera. Um, and there are others, but these are the most common and uh, will be likely used depending on the indication that you're focused on. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In terms of non-motor assessment, uh, the MDS, uh, again, has an excellent resource on their website. 
which lists uh, a number of recommended scales, uh, including multi-dimensional non-motor scales, as well as domain or construct specific uh, non-motor scales. So if there's some construct in particular, like depression or sleep that you're interested in, there are many options there. Not all listed, of course, here. There are other options, but the MDS has a wealth of information on a lot of scales that may be relevant. Next slide. In addition, uh, for uh, what I refer to as health-related quality of life, which is the broad category, including neuropsychiatric symptoms, ADLs, uh, caregiver distress, suicidality ratings, and global ratings, uh, there's some commonly used uh, measures in each of these domains um, that uh, would be at the top of the list when considering different measures. But again, this, this isn't a comprehensive list, and there are potentially others that could be relevant. Uh, most uh, studies of this sort do include some sort of global rating to capture, you know, the clinical impression, what's the, um, what's the clinical impact, and is it observable to a clinician in everyday life, uh, most often included and uh, needs careful consideration. Next slide, please. In terms of cognitive testing, I've sort of organized it first as screening because there's a lot of studies, of course, that will just use uh, a screening measure in order to help ensure uh, and rule out cognitive impairment in these studies. Um, and an MDS working group in 2017 did a re very nice review of global screening scales and cognition and concluded that they didn't, it uh, uh, wasn't necessary in their opinion to develop something new. Uh, and uh, they recommended a couple scales, including the MOCA, that uh, seemed to be serving the uh, purpose well and that borne out over the years, I think, for the MOCA and a couple other scales. They noted, importantly, though, that global cognitive scale screening measures are not suitable for comprehensive neuropsychological testing, of course. And if we go to the next slide, uh, when neuropsychologists think about comprehensive cognitive assessment, we think in terms of uh, tests that measure various uh, cognitive domains. So, uh, these may be uh, relevant to certain indications, but of course include executive function, learning and memory, language, perceptual motor, et cetera. And there are uh, some commonly used test batteries that provide a more comprehensive assessment of cognition that have been used and have some precedent in this area. Uh, ADAS COG has been used, certainly. The R band uh, has been used many times. You'll see reference to uh, what's sort of a generic term, the neuropsychological test battery or NPB. That importantly can really vary depending on what actual scales go into it. Um, the uh, Parkinson's disease progression markers initiative test battery is a very nice uh, collection of tests measuring a number of important domains. And then there's some work from the uniform data set test battery for FTD in, um, in particular. Um, and Lewy body dementia. Uh, there are others, though, available and um, uh, uh, worth considering. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, things can get in particularly, particularly challenging in studies, for example, that require a more complex or more, uh, um, more distinct cognitive measuring measurement, and in this case, of studies of PDMCI. Uh, if you're familiar with this area, the diagnostic criteria require measurement of five domains or constructs, attention, working memory, executive function, language, uh, learning and memory, and visual spatial functions. Uh, each domain needs two measures, and in order to meet the criteria for impairment, two out of the ten measures uh, require evidence of impairment compared to normative data, which can be particularly challenging. Um, this list just, um, again, a number of options available for each domain, including traditional neuropsychological tests, as well as some examples from COG state, uh, computerized battery of tests, but there are other, other options as well. Next slide, please. Lastly, regarding cognitive test selection, just some key points to keep in mind. Uh, you want these measures to measure the construct of interest. They need to be standardized. Uh, in terms of administration scoring and recording, tests really vary in terms of the um, uh, extensiveness which with, with which this is documented. So that's very important. And ideally, you'd have good data on reliability and validity, uh, rate of reliability data if applicable, and the tests 
uh, operationally should be uh, as efficient as possible, least burdensome, and have good psychometric properties for the population. Um, uh, meaning, you mostly you want to try to avoid significant practice effects, floor and, and ceiling effects, depending on what population you're working in. I want to transition now to some overview comments on rater training and some of our experience in this area in Parkinson's and related disorders. Um, uh, the goals, of course, of rater training are to standardize the administration, recording, and scoring of the scales being used in the, in the study. And uh, the uh, result of that, hopefully, is to reduce data variability due to raters and also prevent invalid data from the onset. All studies will have data that is invalid for various reasons, and you want to try to prevent that as much as possible. Rater training can help accomplish that. Um, um, okay, so in terms of rater training methodologies, um, uh, depending on the type of scale, uh, there are options to consider. Uh, most, all scales, of course, have some sort of didactic training or um, a review uh, uh, presentation on the scale and how it works. Uh, you can also implement the more experiential uh, training methods ranging from just uh, quizzes uh, to test raters' knowledge. You can conduct scoring exercises. This is commonly done in, with cognitive tests. Uh, but then even more helpful are more experiential uh, methods including video demonstration, video rating exercises, practice administrations that can be reviewed, and then even sort of one-on-one -on -one or small group applied training where graders get the opportunity to practice and demonstrate their competence. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I, in preparation for this uh, presentation, I tried to dig into the literature to, ref uh, you know, find if there's anything uh, current on, you know, rater training effectiveness in Parkinson's and related disorders, and there really isn't a whole lot published, unfortunately. Um, uh, uh, there is some relevant publications, though, of course, uh, which do show that experienced and trained raters can reliably administer and score the motor examinations, like NDF, PPDRS, Part 3, and related examinations, as long as they have some background and experience. Uh, this has been shown through video rating exercises as well as reports of inter-rater reliability in clinical trials. And in our experience, uh, with appropriate training, most raters with some clinical experience and, and relevant scale experience can reliably do these scales. One very important and key challenge, though, is identifying what we, what we find, which is a very small but important percentage of raters who actually aren't able to do the assessments with training and um, with support. Um, and this can be identified using initial training data uh, and more commonly using in-study central monitoring data. So I'll make a couple comments about what we mean by central monitoring. Next slide. So uh, a little bit of the alphabet suit, but bear with me. Uh, there are two approaches we take to central monitoring. One is called Rater Performance Central Monitoring, or RPCM. And the other is called Database Central Monitoring. And I hope to make this clear, DBC. The next slide. The Rater Performance Central Monitoring, or RPCM, is really, uh, basically, it's a review of the assessment, uh, the form and the audio and the video, if available, uh, by a central expert. We have a, a global network of experts in each of the local languages who use a standardized checklist to review how the scale was done. And uh, this is really sort of our test of rater behavior. You can review just the forms. Uh, most and more uh, beneficial is reviewing the form and the audio. And of course, uh, if applicable, having video for motor examination is also possible to monitor. We find that form and audio is sufficient for most clinical uh, interview scales and cognitive testing. Next slide, please. Now, I wanted to illustrate what we typically see and make the point, sort of uh, visually bring home the point that I made earlier about how most traders do a decent job. This is a typically re typical result from what we see from our RPCM um, monitoring. So this graph is 
the uh, scores that raters have made, total score on our test, on our structured checklist, ranging up to 100. So 100 is uh, on the x-axis would be perfect performance, no errors. It's like a test you'd take in school. 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 90 is a B, et cetera. Okay? We find generally, this is, this is a sample of 831 reviews of 200 raters that most raters do well. The average score is 96. If you're teaching a class, it's a good result. Most of your students did well. They mostly got A's. You have a few B's. But you also have a few C's, a few D's, and even a, a pretty bad F. And so managing and identifying these raters that are the exception to the rule is a really critical uh, and typical finding we see across clinical scales, cognitive scales, motor scales, everything. This is what we often see. Next slide, please. Uh, now, DBC, I'm switching over to what we mean by DBC. And this is data-based, which really means the actual scale data, the scores from the test. It's not focused on the raters. It's focused on the actual test scores. And you can apply uh, various methods, often scatter plots, correlations, other graphical uh, applications to examining the clinical consistency of the scale data. Not a measure of rater performance is does this data look like it should um, and a simple but uh, un not uncommon thing that we see uh, is uh, illustrated with this scatter plot this is a scatter plot of mini mental in the as cog uh, uh, such these are measures that you would expect to relate to one another and they uh, very much do in the normal circumstances but using these scatter plots you can identify outliers that uh, oftentimes are the result of rater error and can be remediated and dealt with. Uh, the case in point here is where a rater uh, literally reverse scored all of the many mental items and the score is a three instead of a 27. Those are the kinds of things, a simple example, but, but one that illustrates the kinds of quality assurance things that we can implement to, to uh, help ensure the data quality is, is as high as it can be. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, uh, another uh, common analysis using database central monitoring, using looking at the actual scales data, is to look at unusual change scores. And if there are data available to uh, inform how to interpret these numbers, it's always helpful. This is an example of MDS, UPDRS, total score change uh, across one year, 52 weeks. The average is about five points change uh, in uh, sort of normal expectations, roughly. And in this sample of 100 cases of change scores, we see about an average of two to three uh, change points, most hovering around that. But there's evidence of one uh, outlier of a 20 point change on the score, which would be clinically unusual to say the least, and, and would be worthy of some sort of follow up and investigation to determine if there was some sort of rater issue that contributed to this, uh, this score. Now, uh, that includes, uh, concludes uh, my section of the presentation um, on traditional assessment selection, training, and monitoring. Thank you for your attention. I certainly look forward to any questions you have. And I think now we're gonna transition to Dr. Sawalski, who will take us from the traditional uh, into the modern era of motor assessment using more advanced technologies and, and digital endpoints. So, see you, Dr. Sawalski. Great. Thank you, Lyle. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I will be covering ways to assess Parkinsonian motor symptoms, um, particularly those that pertain to overall mobility, um, and really review some ways to assess this with instrument and assessments that will complement the clinical outcome assessments um, that have been presented thus far. Next slide, please. So I wanna highlight here, I'm probably preaching to the choir, uh, but the importance of mobility, right? It is a critical determinant of health and overall quality of life. So we wanna make sure in clinical trials that we are quantifying mobility impairment as accurately and as reliably as we can. So next slide, please. The way that mobility is traditionally uh, rated in clinical trials is through clinical rating scales, right? These are gold standard scales, they're very important. Um, but is this enough to quantify mobility 
uh, in a way that's going to reach the objectives of the trial and ultimately, uh, you know, provide ways to prove or, or approve therapeutics that are going to help patients. So in the classic uh, MDS UPDRS, if you look at that scale, there are very few questions that really relate to overall mobility. There's one that is asked directly of the patient as a PRO um, to rate how they feel their walking and balance is. And then there are two questions uh, rated by the, the, the clinician or the examiner um, to assess postural stability and then uh, observe a patient while they're walking and rate them on a scale of zero to four. And then you have the Hone and Yar scale, right, which is uh, you rate from stage one to stage five. So while these assessments are important, um, there's ways to quantify mobility and provide more endpoints that could be useful uh, for clinical trials. Next slide, please. So the way we would do this is by adding digital health technologies, right? So an example of this is instrumenting certain assessments with wearable sensors to reveal this additional insight. Um, so this fits wonderfully in with the traditional COAS. Um, but when there are questions pertaining to mobility, whether it's a ClinRO, a PRO, or most commonly a PERF-O, it's helpful to add instrumentation to assess these in an objective way um, with a multitude of endpoints available that are very reliable over time. Next slide, please. Okay, so the best way to do this is really to quantify and instrument those uh, performance outcome assessments, right? So when we think of mobility, you know, it's really your ability to get from point A to point B successfully per to perform your activities of daily living. So we see this in kind of three breakdowns. Um, you can assess gait, right? There's different ways to look at gait. Uh, we recommend a two minute walk test um, when in which the participant is asked to walk at their most comfortable pace to assess how they walk normally. Um, we have ways to instrument the six minute walk test in which, you know, patients are asked to walk as far as possible for six minutes and measures such as distance covered can be uh, outputted. And then additionally, when you have instrumentation, we can do more than just the straight line walking. Um, we quantify things like gait initiation, right? That period where a patient is standing still and they have to shift their weight to take that first step. Additionally, we look at turns. Right, straight line walking is pretty standard, um, but turning is a more complex task. So it's important to quantify turns uh, to determine certain, certain endpoints that may reveal uh, sensitivity earlier than some of that steady state walking. Another way of balance, or measuring mobility is going to look at balance. So there is dynamic balance components within gait, but also balance can be assessed from a static position. And we have different, different sensory systems uh, that incorporate feedback uh, to contribute to your overall balance. So we have options to instrument balance tests uh, with visual input or no visual input, um, altering the base of support, and altering uh, the, the surface to alter proprioceptive input. And then some other classic scales of mobility are going to be the timed up and go, um, in which a patient stand, sits in a chair, walks, stands up, walks three meters, turns, walks back, and then sits back down. And then a sit to stand test, which can be five times or 30 seconds, which is really an overall assessment of functional lower body strength. So it's helpful to instrument these um, alone for motor assessments, but what can be additionally useful, particularly in Parkinsonian syndromes, is to add a cognitive challenge. And so that was, would be considered a dual task during these motor performance tasks in which patients can be asked to for example, um, do zero subtractions by sevens, which is related to attention and concentration, or verbal fluency tasks, um, naming of particular animals, things like of that nature um, that address executive function. Those, so these can be performed at the same time as a motor assessment and is helpful in, uh, in indications in which both motor and cognitive components are impaired. So next slide, please. So why would we want to instrument gait, right? So well, Gait is not just gait speed, right? When you instrument it, you can look at various domains of gait and dynamic balance that are uniquely affected in different Parkinsonian indications. Next slide, please. Okay, so an example of this, um, something that you cannot get with a standard clinical outcome assessment scale is gait initiation, right? That, that's what I described as a participant standing and they have to shift their balance in order to pick up their foot and take that next step. So in Parkinson's, we do see that this is impaired. Um, 
you know, we, you have to be able to shift your weight enough to pick up that foot. And in PD, as you can see on the figure on the right, that ability to shift that weight laterally um, is impaired. We see less movement in that direction, so it's harder to take that first step forward, and they're less stable in doing so. Another example of this is that static balance, right? So this can be assessed um, generally in research studies and force plates, but we have the ability to do that now with a single sensor uh, placed on the lower back. And so you'll see with the progression of this slide, uh, what types of measures we get to assess balance in Parkinson's disease and other conditions uh, with inertial sensors. So in a healthy control subject, you have a, a relatively small uh, sway area with a smooth path. And in PD, we see that sway area increases uh, because of the instability and is a little bit more jerky in nature. So these are just examples of some things that you can get with these digital health technologies um, that really complement those clinical outcome assessments. Next slide, please. Okay, so it's also, of course, very important to make sure we are capturing endpoints that matter to patients. So there was a nice study done in Parkinson's disease uh, surveying 28 participants. Um, in clinical trials, what about their current PD experience, uh, symptoms experienced, what they feel is insufficiently managed, and what they feel PD researchers should focus on. And so you'll see mobility measures that, that rise to the top here, really overall balance, we see gait, um, but interestingly, we also see cognition, right? So both of these are very relevant in the Parkinsonian indications. Um, so we wanna make sure we're, we're capturing those together. Next slide, please. Okay, so not only are both mobility and cognition important to patients, they are actually related and they demonstrate very levels of decline among different Parkinsonian syndromes. Okay, so these are both associated with well-being and overall quality of life. Uh, mobility and cognitive impairments are actually regulated by shared brain resources. And when there's deterioration in these resources, we see an increase in the risk of developing dementia, falls, and fractures. There have been numerous studies done, longitudinal studies done with a large uh, amount of subjects looking at ambulatory elders um, without any decline present that were followed. Uh, and over time, it was revealed that cogn cognition is associated with incident mobility impairment and mobility decline. And a very nice longitudinal study, uh, st longitudinal study was done in 182 early onset Parkinsonian participants and followed. And it was revealed that in PD, when mild cognitive impairment and freezing of gait were, uh, were present, uh, that is significantly associated with shorter survival. When we look at those more atypical Parkinsonian patients, um, such as MSA or PSP, uh, this link was actually related to the highest mortality. So it is clear that there's a link in shared resources for cognitive uh, impairment and mobility. And it's really important that we're quantifying these collectively uh, together. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we determine which digital mobility endpoints are most suitable for your particular uh, Parkinsonism study, right? So um, Chris highlighted some of the, the FDA guidance documents that are very useful uh, in considering you know, what you should look at to assess this. So uh, we've incorporated that with our approach here. Uh, first of all, you're going to want to assess digital health tools um, to make sure they're verified and valid uh, in the indication uh, of interest. Um, we want them to reveal more insight, right, versus standard clinical outcome assessments. Otherwise, what's the point in adding them, right? But we do see a lot of value here. Um, it is best that the indication and the endpoints are sensitive and specific to the indication. Uh, relative to the disease stage and progression, right? So different symptoms show up at different times and the progression of these symptoms is not necessarily linear. So you really need to look at, you know, what phase of disease the participants are in or will are assumed to progress in depending upon the duration of the study and the course of disease. And then of course, we need to make sure that the endpoints captured are meaningful to patient function, um, which it is clear that mobility matters to patients as does cognition. And then you're going to want to, of course, uh, look at, you know, the effect of intervention. Um, and so we'll get to that in a later slide. But here, PD is um, highly studied. There's a wealth of data demonstrating these types of endpoints that are useful to capture. 
So in a study looking at PD compared to controls on a variety of digital measures of gait, four rise to the top. We see slowed turn velocity, reduction in arm swing range of motion, a decreased foot strike angle, and a smaller first step. And it just so happens that these measures also correlate to uh, disease severity. If we look at slow turn velocity, it is related to the total MDS UPDRS, and that uh, strength of that correlation increases when you look at just the motor component. Um, when we look at that foot strike angle, right, that's related to that shuffling that Parkinson's participants experience. Um, that is related to the uh, MDS UPDRS part two and the PDQ 39 for quality of life assessments. So, and it's also important to look at prodromal stage, and there's evidence that arm swing asymmetry, step time variability and asymmetry, um, and all gait characteristics are present in prodromal PD. So these are things we wanna capture um, as they may be associated with a shorter time to diagnosis. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so effects of intervention. One of the classic interventions in PD is levodopa, right? So but we want to understand the, the effects. So, um, you know, PD is a hypokinetic movement disorder, so levodopa aims to improve that movement, right? It takes that smaller, slower movement, and we do see improvements in the size and the speed of movement. Um, that, is that is apparent here uh, by, the, by the blue, improving pace and upper body measures. However, it does worsen some of that static balance control. So it is really important to assess these measures comprehensively to look at both efficacy and safety. Next slide, please. Now, if with PD, if we get into PD with mild cognitive impairment, uh, we see worsening of these endpoints, right? We see that both in single task activities um, with some of these key measures. And then when you add a dual task uh, into the mix, we do see more of these measures uh, demonstrating differences between PD and PD with MCI. Next slide, please. So um, as we get into the other Parkinsonian uh, conditions, we have PD and then the atypicals, right? So PD really kind of stands out. With the atypicals, um, you know, we see a broader base gait. Um, we see difficulty doing tandem gait. And then there are some key features in each indication that makes them the unique that we want to consider quantifying. So in CBS and CBD, we see more asymmetry initially. In PSP, we see a careless style of gait and backward falls. And then in MSA, um, we see other symptoms come in early and there's even neurological, um, neurogenic orthostatic hypertension that relate to falls. So we wanna make sure to quantify motor impairment specifically uh, that to help differentiate between these types of indications. Next slide, please. So as we do quantify this by adding wearable sensor technology or DHTs, um, we see differences. So in this study, there's uh, it's demonstrated with, if you look at MSA and PSP relative to idiopathic Parkinson's disease, um, we see more severely effective gait and balance, specifically reduced stride length, gait velocity, and a longer time of the tug task, timed up and go task. Next slide, please. Now, uh, specifically in multiple system atrophy from a clinical perspective, we see impairments in balance. In fact, the most frequent feature that is found and reported within the first three years from onset is postural instability with recurrent falls. Um, we see that broad base gait and increased gait variability, and then difficulty with postural transitions in that sit to stand and stand to sit um, task that you see in a timed up and go or a five times sit to stand. Now on the next slide, if we instrument these types of tests, we can see those particular metrics that come out. So with balance, um, we see here a study that performed had different conditions for balance impairment. And in MSA, the only um, condition they could stand in was with a firm surface and eyes open, and they had repeated falls with the other conditions. So we see that postural sway is excessive in this indication. And then on the right, we look at specific gait measures, and we see high variability. So we see measures like stride time, swing time, stance, but we're looking at um, uh, the variability of those measures, and we see that increased in MSA, and it actually came out the strongest when participants were uh, asked to walk slowly. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving into another uh, atypical Parkinsonism is uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. And so there's a really nice study done here on a, high, a large number of participants. Um, and it 
it was demonstrated that motor, motor slowing is present in approximately 70% of participants three years prior to the diagnosis. And in that prodromal phase, at least 50% of patients um, demonstrated a gait disorder. So again, highlighting the importance to quantify these and track them along the way. Next slide, please. Now, when you're looking at dementia with Lewy bodies, um, you know, this can get paired in with other dementia disease subtypes. And so we see a study here that nicely differentiates um, the different subtypes with the use of wearable measures. And what we see here, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, is differentiated by looking at standard deviation of step velocity and length, and then also asymmetry measures here. Next slide, please. So with those participants, um, as far as uh, balance goes, we actually don't see as much of a, of a difference in, um, in balance, static balance, but we do see it more highly present in Parkinson's disease with dementia. So it's really important to assess not only walking, but also balance, right? There are different neurological pathways uh, that contribute to both. So you want a comprehensive assessment of each. Next slide, please. All right, and then we move into the talopathies. So mobility impairment in progressive supranuclear palsy. We see more severe uh, impairment in all, like posture gait and postural transitions. Um, remember in PSP, we see that um, patients fall backwards frequently. So we see uh, less stability in the anterior posterior position when looking at static balance. We see worsening in those features that um, <clears throat> is in alignment with that falling backwards. On the right, we have some of those gait measures. We see an increase in cadence. Um, we also see an increase in that sit to stand duration. Um, and then turns are also uh, much more highly affected when looking at uh, PSP compared to PD as well as healthy controls. And then the following study shows a, uh, some longitudinal work, uh, some excellent work that was done um, incorporating the use of three digital gait feature, features that were measured with wearable sensors which actually were able to detect statistically significant progression three months in advance of the classic clinical scores. Um, additionally, wearable sensors have been used to differentiate between the different PSP phenotypes um, with the use of single and also that dual cognitive task. Next slide, please. All right, and then we finally come to cortical basal degeneration, another rare indication. Um, so, <clears throat> And a natural history study of 14 um, patients with CVD um, demonstrated the most commonly reported symptom at onset was asymmetric limb clumsiness. So, you know, when you, when you quantify movement, you want to make sure you have um, sensors placed on various limbs so that you can look at asymmetric measures. And then over the course of the disease, the patients all developed a gait disorder and nearly all had postural imbalance. Again, important things to quantify. And then in another study in a review of 147 cases revealed that 93% had a high, higher cortical dysfunction and then 80% of those had, had gait disorders. So very important to capture this data. So in summary, um, in addition to the traditional clinical outcome assessments for motor assessments, um, it is imperative to add wearable sensor technology, right? Or that those digital health tools and technologies um, that we pointed to in the FDA guidance. This helps capture meaningful insights um, with objective digital endpoints of mobility that are precise, accurate, and reliable. Um, we also want to highlight the importance of capturing these mobility endpoints in conjunction with cognitive assessments um, for a comprehensive fit for purpose approach, particularly in the Parkinsonian indications. So just an overall recommendation here is to follow up on a, a um, chart that Lyle had presented and we recommend adding some instrument and perfo assessments to complement those motor assessments, which can be done in a short period of time by doing a quick two minute walk, a 30 second balance test and perhaps a timed up and go. And with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and we wanna open the floor up to see if there are any questions for, for any of us here. Yes, well, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. I would like to invite our audience at this time to continue sending their questions or comments right now using the questions window for this Q&A portion of our webinar. Now, I've already received some questions from the audience, so we'll get ourselves started with those. Right here, I've got our first question wondering simply, what is the feasibility of doing remote studies in PD? Yeah, 
Uh, thanks for that question. So I'll, I'll have, I think, both Lyle and uh, Kristen weigh in on that. I, I think it'll be interesting to get both of your perspectives there. Go ahead, Kristen. Sure. Um, as far as a motor perspective, we have, you know, traditionally performed these clinical tests or, or mobility tests in a controlled environment in the clinic. Um, but there are now remote technologies to enable the same assessment to be performed in a patient's home. Um, and so, so this is currently feasible. I think thanks to, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the COVID, <laughs> COVID epidemic that we all experienced, we really were able to progress some of these technologies to capture that in a decentralized way. Great, very good. Uh, thank you so much for that. I don't know, Lyle, sorry, if you had some Yeah, more just, just to, to um, yeah, sure, thanks, Ryan. Just to add, um, you know, there's a long history of video recording, of course, in Parkinson's, which can be um, uh, done remotely, and that ties into uh, app applying video recording technology to capturing uh, motor either in a remote clinic or in home. Uh, the at-home PD study is really kind of a pioneering effort to uh, attempt this, uh, uh, apply many of the traditional measures from a remote setting. <clears throat> MDS is working on some uh, guidance on how to do uh, MDS UPDRS, at least, I think, and maybe others. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's very feasible. It's not easy necessarily, but it's, uh, it's definitely feasible. Um, and my understanding of, you know, there's a couple of studies that have asked patients about it. They're keen to do it and uh, very interested in, in applying as much as we can to, to this area. Very good. Thank you so much for your insight on that. Uh, the next question I have here would like to know, what are some of the most common mistakes you see when teams are choosing assessments for clinical trials? Uh, do, you, do you want to take this one, Lyle? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the things we see is trying to include too many measures. Um, uh, you know, three, four, five measures of similar sort of constructs. So um, that's one of the most common things. Um, in terms of rate or training, not as much of a mistake, but just really keeping in mind the site and rate or experience at the site. Um, Certainly for clinical scales, uh, clinical motor examinations, you know, you have to have some foundation of background and experience in doing these things. And that's true to some extent with clinical interviews and psychometric tests. So just keeping in mind the sites and the, and the staff that they have to support, support the work. All right, very good. Thank you so much. Um, next, I have here a question wondering to what degree is Clario and CogState's future development linked with the availability of treatment interventions to clinically, clinically validate the digital measures? Um, so I'll take a first pass of this. I think this is a really interesting question. So um, I, I think it depends um, under what circumstances we, we're intending to use digital tools and, you know, what what are the, the really uh, are the guiding reasons for their application in a trial? And, and we can see that with digital tools, we have opportunities to do a number of different things, as, as I think um, uh, both Lyle and Kristen have, have outlined. We can measure the same kinds of concepts, but in different ways. Um, and an example of that is the ability to, uh, for example, more easily conduct remote assessment. So it, it can be you know, easier to conduct assessment in the patient's own home, or we can have um, continuously or, or passively monitored assessments or unsupervised assessments. And, and, and that can be a circumstance under which you know, what we want to know is that the um, assessments that we have are in important respects equivalent to the existing tools, that you, you measure that same concept in a, in a valid and reliable way. And, and in that sense, we don't need to um, have successful therapeutic intervention trials in order to be able to conduct that kind of, um, of validation work. Um, the, the other kinds of circumstances are the, the ability to measure different things so that we can measure new concepts of interest. And Kristen really out, nicely outlined some of those um, comparisons where we can see that um, some of those digital tools are able to measure aspects of movement that we know are not at all captured by the gold standard assessments and, and we can see that um, it's important there to conduct um, 
really unique validation work in order to demonstrate um, the, the relevance and meaningfulness for patients um, to understand how to interpret the data. Um, I think where, where we may see the real value in, in data that comes from a successful therapeutic intervention are you know, those circumstances where um, we, we're validating tools for a new context of use because we believe that they may have substantial advantages over existing tools and that that additional therapeutic interventional data might demonstrate that advantage that we can actually directly compare within a successful trial the new um, to the to the gold standard and seek to um, replace it. But I think there are already these circumstances where we don't need that kind of evidence because we're either measuring the same thing in a different way or we're measuring a different thing entirely. I, I don't know if you've got further thoughts there, Lyle, Kristen. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think you capture that really well, Chris. I did want to answer from the perspective of, of any assessments also that were, you know, sort of missing. And so, you know, my perspective on, you know, obviously with the clinical outcome assessments is you want to instrument uh, mobility, um, but it's also important to pick the correct instrument based upon the indication, right? There's a big push to go to single sensor, um, which is really important and relevant in a lot of indications. Uh, but there are other indications where you want a multi-sensor approach because there are those particular movement impairments that, that are important to capture that are more sensitive. So I just wanted to add that on to a previous question. That's great, wonderful. Thank you, both of you and all of you really for your wonderful insights on these questions from our audience. However, we have reached the end of our Q&A portion for the webinar. Um, if we couldn't attend to your questions though, know that the team at Cog State and Clario will follow up with you. Or if you have some further questions, you can direct them to the email address that's up on your screen. I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen as you exit, and your participation is appreciated as it helps us to improve our webinars. Now, I've also sent you a link in the chat box, and with this link, you'll be able to view the recording of this event on this page, and you can also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording here as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join me once more in thanking our speakers for their wonderful time here today. We hope that you all found the webinar informative. Have a great day, everybody, and thank you for coming. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thank you all.